Hello and welcome to the Bard Law Podcast, where lawyers and law students in Pakistan are introduced to various practice areas and aspects of the legal profession. My name is Sara Kazmi, and today I'm going to be speaking to Barrister Taimur Malik, who's joining me to give some insight into the legal practice of technology startup. Taimur is a partner at a leading international law firm, Clyde & Co., he was called to the bar from the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn, and he has an MBA degree from the University of Oxford. Really looking forward to our discussion today, and I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Hi, Tamur, Welcome. Thanks for joining. Uh, I just learned that you have an MBA degree. That's interesting. Uh, maybe we can start with that. I mean, I'm sure our listeners would be interested to know whether an MBA degree helps a lawyer, especially when you're advising in the commercial sector. Hi, Sarah. Uh, It's great to be on this podcast. Uh, Very uh, useful uh, initiative. And thanks for inviting me to it. The MBA degree, I I feel it it is helpful. So the background to that is that uh, I have uh, my first degree was in business information systems. And then I did... uh, uh, my law degree so i have a bit of a business background and then uh, b- between 2010 and 12 when i was working in house at a global mining company i did a journal management program at the dutch business school at the university of cambridge which was like a condensed mba for senior executives that was part of my organization's leadership development uh, pathway and, and that's when i realized that you know uh, i'm doing more and more commercial work with my clients and not just technology companies but generally as well and uh, I, I felt that the legal skills or, or the skills that we learn as a lawyer as to where to look for answers that I have and then maybe I need to uh, uh, do some more uh, deep dive into uh, business and finance courses and that's when I decided I'll do an MBA one day and then uh, I became a partner at a US law firm and the early years as a partner can be pretty tough so I didn't have that opportunity. So I did the MBA on an executive route, uh, uh, you know, much later in 2017, 18. Uh, and uh, it was a great experience. Uh, my focus was uh, on uh, social entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, and technology, uh, private investment, private equity investments, and so on. Um, and that's helped me not just with my legal work or my client's work. That's also helped me with managing my own finances. Uh, for example, I am an angel investor uh, in, in, in Pakistani and Middle Eastern tech startups. So, uh, uh, so when you look at how valuations are done, um, how term sheets are negotiated, what rights do, uh, do investors need or want, and uh, what also works from a, from a founder's perspective or what kind of balance needs to be created uh, so that it's not a situation where founders end up giving too much authority or control to investors and then lose interest in the startup. So it's, it's those things, some of those things you learn with experience, some you can be taught. So I've gone uh, through both uh, uh, both ways and, uh, uh, and and now I find that it's it, it's very useful for my clients. They, uh, they, they value uh, more than me, I forget at times that I have an MBA, but my clients in many cases remember that or mention it uh, or involve me in more commercial discussions uh, or negotiations with counterparties and not just purely legal uh, a legal review of documents. And do you want to give our listeners a bit of an overview of some of your own initiatives that you have? So uh, my initiatives are, are, are not commercial initiatives as such, uh, obviously, at the moment, uh, you, you know, you know of Courting the Law, uh, which is Pakistan's first legal news and analysis portal. There's Insaf Camp, uh, which uh, aims to increase legal literacy in the masses. Uh, there is Kanun Dan, uh, which was started by five law students led by Sulman. Uh, and uh, we joined them uh, later on in their journey. Uh, and that's a video content a uh, development project focused on legal matters. And uh, uh, there is motisip.pk, which is a uh, online bot-based website which uh, helps generate in English and Urdu uh, complaints to any of the nine different ombudspersons in Pakistan. So it's a, it's a response-driven website. So you, you don't need to know the law. 
you don't need to know whether your complaint is with, going to be filed with the tax ombudsman, ombudsperson, or the provincial ombudsperson in a province. You just need to keep answering the questions, and uh, you, 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 at the end, you will end up generating a, a clean, neat uh, application which can be submitted uh, to the relevant ombudsperson's office. Um, you know, and then there's Youth General Assembly started by Fahad, and uh, I, then I came on board later. It's evolved into a large youth uh, leadership development project across the country. I think it has more than 5,000 members now. So I, I am the patron, uh, I, and, and I'm sure they, 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 there are other things. So uh, the, the idea behind everything is it didn't all start at the same time was to, as and when people came up with ideas or I had ideas and I came across young students or uh, young professionals who wanted to do something other than just commercial work as well, um, I, you know, I've, uh, I've been interested in supporting those initiatives. So, uh, so it, it's fortunate that all of the ones that I've mentioned, you know, they've all grown into uh, large uh, initiatives on their own. And I remember I came across Kanunda and uh, like I think a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and I was like, wow, these are law students that are doing this. And I was like, what was I doing when I was a student? Uh, but I really like that initiative. So coming to the topic, Temur, I do want to start with talking uh, a bit about the tech startup ecosystem in Pakistan and what was your first introduction to it? Uh, because for Islamabad, I only started paying attention maybe 2016 and 17 when these young founders would, would try and connect with me primarily for legal advice. So I guess I was aware of some of the legal issues, but not really understanding the entire ecosystem. And it wasn't until I registered my own firm, Energy Resource Management, that we were looking for office space where we could do trainings because it was a training based firm. So like five minutes from my house, the Indus entrepreneurs had a co-working space called We Create Center, which was meant for women entrepreneurs. So when I leased that space, the other co-workers I had were these, someone was making an app or, you know, they were these tech startup founders. And that's when I learned that, oh, you have these programs that support startups, incubators, accelerators. But for me, it wasn't until 2018 um, that I realized uh, that, this is an entire sort of world in itself. But I'm curious to know, uh, when did you first interact with this tech startup world? So my uh, first proper uh, interaction with, with the space was, you know, in the late 90s, uh, just when I finished my intervals, uh, along with two other friends, I started education.com.pk and travel.com.pk. So a travel portal for Pakistan and an education portal for Pakistan. So, uh, but it was too early for Pakistan. The, uh, the internet penetration wasn't there. And yeah. you know, I think everybody around us also felt that we were just taking a gap here and then we go away and study abroad or do something else. So, uh, so, so, so that's what happened. You know, the uh, projects went offline uh, after a year. We went abroad to study. Those two co-founders of mine, one is a director at Google in Europe. Uh, the other works in Saudi at a, at a senior position in the telco. So we all learned from our experiences. I, of course, became a lawyer. That's what I always wanted to do. Uh, but uh, I come from a family of lawyers, and uh, my mother's suggestion was to do or study something else before doing law. I think she was hoping that I would choose something else eventually. <laughs> okay. But I think now she's happy that I, I, I did what I did. Uh, but uh, so, so that was the first interaction. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, as things happen, uh, the next few years, I was focused on my studies. Then, initial years in the legal profession, uh, they, I was the you know first proper executive director of the Research Society of International Law. Uh, you know, so that was a journey in itself. Then I moved to the Middle East in two thousand eight, and then when I moved to the Middle East, the first few years again were focused on uh, more traditional legal practice. Uh, and then I went in house for a couple of years. Also, didn't have time. So uh, it's again after I would say 2012 that I uh, sort of again got interested in the space in Pakistan. In between, I have to say I made a few uh, investments here and there with Pakistani tech founders uh, so across different you know uh, uh, sectors. Uh, some of them you know uh, didn't go anywhere, which is fine. Uh, some are doing this. one in particular in edtech. Uh, play is, is still operational and it's growing uh, by, by each year. 
and uh, and then then of course all these uh, coating law and other uh, sort of more social entrepreneurship type projects came along uh, and then uh, with with a few other friends i was a member of the entrepreneurs organization uh, the hard chapter and we started organizing global student entrepreneur awards so i got involved as a board member and, and sort of a, a jury member with that uh, you know in 2015 and we held uh, rounds in in all the major cities in pakistan selected startups each year to send to the international rounds abroad so and i started speaking at all the incubators and accelerators that you hear of in pakistan around that time so 2015 16 so it was very early so i i don't yeah. think that any other lawyer was uh, interested or involved in this space at that time and and the reason for that involvement was also because on my professional side as a partner at uh, at that time at Curtis Mellor Provost which is a US firm i was doing tech startup work in in the middle east so i was doing uh, tech investments i was representing so, uh, sovereign investment funds and private family offices investing in tech startups i helped set up oman's technology fund uh, maybe 6 uh, 7 years ago they've made i think about four investments in pakistani startups since then uh, and so so that was the thing i started mentoring uh, some uh, startups i got involved with some in oman and dubai as well and, and saudi so uh, so so that was the journey and then uh, you know one particular startup uh, from which i learned a lot uh, was a was a food delivery app which is now worth uh, more than 10 billion dollars uh, i started representing them on all their uh, strategic matters uh, in the region and with my other partners across australia us italy turkey they made they did acquisitions everywhere and uh, even though i used local partners to assist with legal requirements in each country i was the commercial lead from the client side uh, advising them on you know on the best strategy to acquire uh, or restructure a business in a place so that gave a lot of insights and uh, i just thought that hopefully one day i can apply all that uh, the you know expertise and knowledge uh, for the benefit of pakistani startups and help them scale to the same level uh, in fact if i can name this particular startup it was for those of you who lived abroad or visited dubai or london etc it's zomato it's a it's it's a food app uh, yeah. very very big and very successful Uh, and uh, it started from india right so uh, and uh, so there's no reason i thought why they could be startups from pakistan which could be worth billions of dollars eventually as well so when i had started working with them uh, on their legal matters they were uh, very new uh, and had just started off so um, now i'm fortunate to be involved uh, you know in one form or the other uh, with, the, uh, with the tech space in pakistan uh, at the policy level or otherwise as well um, i represent many of the international investors who have invested in pakistani startups over the years um, so so that's a, that's useful as well and at the end of the day it's a it's a matter of experience really i mean you learn from each tra- transaction from each experience and then hope that you know that collective experience can be utilized for the benefit of others eventually Yeah so when we say tech startup uh, we always hear these different categories of fintech edtech healthtech energy tech legal tech what is it that we're talking about what are the different types of technology what is it that makes a startup business a tech business so i would say anything with a tech element would be uh, a tech startup so if if a uh, if there is a you know a retail play but it has a, an app as well and it is focused on scaling through the app and not traditional uh, brick and mortar stores i would say it's a it's a tech play of course if you talk to some more conservative technologists they would say it has to be a deep tech type of thing artificial intelligence internet of uh, t- uh, things kind of project to qualify as a pure technology startup uh, but in pakistan at the moment what you generally see in most cases are uh, you know businesses which are using technology for scaling or for uh, uh, for for growing in different directions so uh, ad tech of course you can say many of the ad tech startups are technology plays because you know they are digitizing the learning experience 
uh, and providing a virtual learning experience to students. Health tech has gone from just a, a booking platform or medicine delivery platforms to now online consultations. Uh, and that is helping people, you know, in many ways, people don't need to come from Shekhupura or Faisalabad to a specialist doctor, let's say in Lahore or Karachi, you know, uh, if they can do an initial online consultation. And uh, grocery deliveries, of course, during the pandemic, we've all, uh, many of us have experienced that. Hopefully, uh, you, you know, that, that sector will keep growing and expanding. Uh, Pakistan uh, being an agricultural economy, it's great to see many ag agri-tech businesses coming up there, uh, helping uh, improve uh, yields, hopefully, and assisting farmers reach markets and uh, get, get better prices and whatnot. So uh, uh, reducing wastage. So all sorts of things are happening in this space. So it's, it's very exciting, right? So, I mean, uh, and these are quality startups now. So what we saw six, seven years ago were these universities had, had made incubation centers and uh, uh, final year students would do uh, capstone projects and will try and turn it into a startup, and, but not, you know, and then they'll get an MNC job and leave, right? So what's happening now in the last couple of years is not that. These are people with five, 10 or 15 years of professional experience, in many cases, international experience um, uh, you'd with, with excellent academic and professional background. And, and they have consciously, you know, sort of given up their corporate uh, careers and, and, and started these companies. So they're way more mature. Uh, that's why you see more investment coming in because investors feel they can trust this group of people more. And that's across these ed techs, health techs, agri techs, fintechs, you know, all of these things that you were, you were mentioning. Uh, the quality of tech startup founders has really gone up in Pakistan. And, and so has the quality of investors and people like me uh, probably can't invest now because the investment ticket sizes are really going up, right? So uh, uh, you can, but smaller ticket sizes. So uh, I, I, now it's the international investors which are coming in with million dollar, multi-million dollar checks, right? And that's hopefully only going to increase with time because we are way far behind, not just from India, but also from countries like comparable countries like Indonesia, Turkey, and Egypt which have their internal problems, uh, have large markets like us, but similar startups there are valued at completely different uh, uh, valuations. So, uh, uh, you know, and, and that's why I think the ecosystem requires not just uh, uh, founders and uh, employees working with them, or, uh, uh, you know, they also need qualified uh, legal experts who can guide them properly. You also need tax experts. You need... You know, people who can advise uh, startups which have to import or export products on customs duty issues. Right? These are things that uh, people don't know about. Uh, a tech founder told me recently that, you know, they started a, a project uh, and then they imported, you know, a few hundred devices worth a lot of money. Uh, and that was, you know, substantial part of their initial, um, uh, you know, funds. Uh, and then, the, you know, when the goods, the products arrived at the, port in Karachi, they realized they couldn't really um, import them that easily, right? So if they had taken proper advice, that would have been important. Another startup founder mentioned to me that, you know, their lawyers or consultants didn't tell them they had to get registered with Punjab Revenue Authority for sales tax registration or with, uh, with Sindh Revenue Board for, uh, for the same purpose. And they kept, uh, you know, doing their operations for a year or so and eventually when uh, they got registered with one of them, they got a notice for previous payments and fines and whatnot. So those are not things that you know uh, our startups should be facing. Uh, so it's it's all uh, well and good to do a general course on contract law or that companies should be incorporated. There there are a lot of other nuances that, for example, I'm mentioning very Pakistan specific issues, right? Things that startups need to consider because a business is a, a to run a business involves a lot more than just establishing a company, opening a bank account, renting a place, and just starting. Right. So, uh, and that's true, by the way, elsewhere as well. So, uh, fintechs, of course, are more regulated because they need state bank approvals. In some cases, they need to be uh, registered as a non-banking finance company with the SECP as well. Uh, they, but each each segment is is a, is a bit different and would require a different set of approvals and licenses. 
uh, potentially in different provinces. Um, so there's a lot of scope uh, for quality uh, legal advice to be provided. There are literally hundreds of startups out there. Uh, and if uh, you know, I did a random survey with half of them, you know, I'm sure the answer would be uh, we don't have access to enough uh, uh, quality legal resources in Pakistan. Uh, unfortunately, people like me can be difficult to get hold of or be very expensive. So also, that's not the target market uh, for lawyers like me. So it has to be a younger generation of lawyers which can be more cost effective, can provide more time uh, and attention uh, and, and work with these startups al- through their journey. So for young lawyers, uh, would you say, again, coming back to tech startups specifically, how much of an understanding do they need to have about the technology of that particular startup? Can they get away with a very basic level understanding or do they need to know as much as perhaps the founders or, or the business does? So it's always good to invest time in learning about the client's business. So uh, one thing I would say that, you know, my MBA or previous business uh, education has helped me with is that I try to learn about the client's business before really engaging with them, right? So if somebody approaches me, I don't think many lawyers do that. Uh, you know, even halfway through uh, a matter, a corporate matter or litigation, they wouldn't really know what the client does, right? Unless it's a very traditional, you know, company in the FMCG business or, you know, or something like that. Uh, so in a, in the tech space, I think it is important to get to know your client's business. Do some, you know, it doesn't take long. You just need to spend, you know, some time at their office, maybe a day, half a day. You know, work, work, meet with different team, understand, sit with the founders, and understand their own journey and their own uh, requirements, uh, so that you're a better place to help them. And I, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, SCCP just a few days ago issued a notice. Uh, to certain uh, companies in, in Pakistan who they said were doing things which were not allowed by Pakistani laws in terms of fractional ownership of real estate, right? Uh, you speak to some of those founders, uh, you know, and they will tell you they took legal advice from people around us. Uh, but the thing is, they, did the lawyers really uh, put in an effort to understand what those companies were trying to do? what fractional ownership of real estate is, how are they going to tokenize uh, you know, uh, shares or units in a property, uh, you know, and how is it all going to be compliant with Pakistani laws. So I think it, at times it's not that somebody gave wrong advice. Perhaps they didn't really fully understand what the client was trying to do. So, uh, so in that sense, I would say it is important because if you don't understand that, you know, law is a lot there are lots of gray areas of law. That's why there's all this litigation and, and you know need for interpretation of different of contracts and laws by the judiciary uh, because things yeah. can be argued different ways. It's important you understand pro- things properly and then give advice accordingly. Uh, and I think this applies uh, to traditional business as well, but especially to technology startups. Right. So if you also talk about contracts, obviously they're used for every type of business, but can you also tell us about the different types of contracts that tech startups use at various stages? So the first thing is that, uh, you know, because it, it's difficult to put a valuation on a startup's business in its early days. So uh, unlike normal business uh, agreements where, where somebody will invest money against uh, fixed equity in a company and you will get shares issued in their name. Startup world works slightly different. So you will see a lot of convertible or safe notes where uh, investors are putting in money uh, in return for uh, certain uh, certain terms whereby they will get equity when uh, the, the company's valuation is done at a future round. And they will get a discount on that uh, pricing for them. So they don't get anything up front. So that's one way of doing it. So, uh, so they could be that. Also, because let's say, uh, you know, angel investors like me, we don't want our names mentioned in every startup's uh, equity table before the startup really becomes something because it's very difficult to then remove yourself, liquidate a company and all that. So if you are comfortable, yes, there is less security. You just sign a convertible no loan agreement or a safe document and hope that the startup does well. Then you can decide if you really want shares in that company at a, 
at some point. Um, so, so that so it's a slightly different arrangement. So, I think lawyers do need to understand that if somebody comes to them, it's not the the run of the mill. Let's get rigid shares issued at S through SCCP. That's not the the case. The other thing is, in terms of in foreign investment readiness, the common thing, not just in Pakistan, elsewhere as well, is to have foreign hold co structures. So. And then that foreign holco will own the Pakistani opco or operating company, right? So when the foreign company invests into the Pakistani company, all that investment should be registered uh, through the state bank, uh, PRC, proceed realization certificate, and all that should be issued. So tomorrow dividends can be declared and and uh, and returned to the hold because that's where the investors will uh, want their returns um, and will invest money. Mostly in dollar terms. So all these Pakistani startups you hear, somebody has raised X million dollars, somebody has raised Y million dollars. These are Pakistani companies operating in rupees, right? Uh, but they're they're raising funds in dollars, and of course their accountability is also going to be in dollars. So uh, that's difficult to do at a Pakistani opco level. So naturally there 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 is a market demand at this stage till Pakistan improves further improves its uh, corporate regulatory structures to have hold calls abroad. Uh, so with that comes a different set of documents as to how these companies operate and need to be set up and you need to be familiar and you shouldn't try and do everything yourself. So, uh, I, you know, I am a partner at a firm which has maybe 10 offices in the US. I would still use a very specialized uh, lawyer, let's say in Delaware, where I don't have an office. Uh, so an external lawyer to help with certain things, right? Or, or, or in Cayman Islands or Netherlands or wherever. Uh, the structures are being established. The other thing is that, uh, you know, in startups, you are not paying your employees too much. So you are incentivized by them by saying you will get some equity at some certain point. So there will be a vesting schedule. If you hit some milestones, if you work with us for X number of years, each, each year some shares get vested in you. Uh, and uh, so, so that those kind of agreements are also important to see. Uh, Eventually, there will be soft employee stock option program or plans that will be implemented. Uh, you may have advisor equity agreements, uh, so you may promise a return again for certain uh, uh, commitment, time commitment, or otherwise to people who are industry leaders in your field, and you want them. They are not your co-founders. They, will, they won't do, don't want to be. They're not your investors, uh, but you want their guidance and support. Uh, in your early days, or even as you grow, and uh, you may need to offer them some uh, some equity for for that purpose, right? So that's again something that's common across the world. Uh, you, you know, so and then there are partner referral programs. You may, to, you may be building something where you may you may need to incentivize um, other companies, organizations to bring customers to you to help you scale up, and they may be. Referral programs that need to be set up. Uh, intellectual property is the key thing with technology startups. Uh, so registrations and everything around it. If IP is registered with a foreign hold co, but the local opco is using it, or if you are in a business where your a partner organization is using your IP as well, you need to ensure that you have proper technology licensing agreements, IP protection in place as well. Um, and then. Uh, Really, really, I mean, it depends on what the startup does. So there can be just uh, so many different kinds of uh, agreements uh, that, that may be relevant. And then, and the thing is that in order to cut costs or also because of the, you know, the general impression or bad impression that uh, non lawyers have about the legal community in Pakistan, people at times tend to avoid using lawyers. And, and that can uh, really create difficulty once they become Hopefully, bigger, uh, you know, raise funds, and then they, somebody comes and does a deep dive legal due diligence of their books, of their documents, and realizes that there are lots of flaws there. Right. So, uh, so I would say to the found, startup founders as well, use lawyer. If they don't know everything, if your preferred lawyer doesn't know too much about your sector, maybe work with them. You know, there's enough material available online now to read up. Law is all about you know continuing education. And learning, we still do that. Uh, you don't know answers to everything. There are days where you still need to learn skill or uh, you know new uh, new things in, in a particular field of law. So, would encourage people to do that. 
and, uh, and and lawyers do need to really read up on these things. You know, this is not a fly by night operation that you think, oh, you know, this is the same thing. If I can advise, uh, you know, a big corporation, I can advise a tech startup as well. At times, it may be more difficult to advise a tech startup given the uh, given that they won't have the same internal controls uh, as a big corporation and also their uh, uh, the area of their practice may be pushing the boundaries of legal and regulatory regime in the country. So these investor agreements that startups have, terms of the financing, is it negotiated? Are, are lawyers even used at that stage? Or they're just sort of considered to be standard from an investor point of view? I think these are negotiated because there are always terms that can be negotiated. Uh, whether people use lawyers or not, that's a personal choice, but that's a dangerous thing not to use a lawyer. Uh, and then you re- can regret later. Uh, they, they, normally it starts with a term sheet, right? So the term sheet yeah. will come. It can be an investor, which will be normally given term sheet, say, look, we'll invest this much. We, uh, may have equity or convertible, uh, rights, but at the same time, we want a board seat for as long as we are a shareholder in the company. Or we want a list of reserve matters which you can't decide without our consent. So uh, there can be all sorts of things that can go in. And it's up to the startup founders also to negotiate them so that, yes, the investor is adding value and keeping a check on their perhaps um, at times unrealistic ambitions in certain respects and adding value by, you know, keeping them more focused. Uh, But at the same time, this should not be restrictive are so restrictive that the startup founders feel that they can no longer operate their company as their own. Uh, and uh, so it starts from the term sheet. Once the term sheet is agreed, of course, this, depending on whether it's equity or convertible uh, documents that are being signed, um, you know, shareholders agreements or subscription agreements and all, all that can kick in and, and will need to be done. So, uh, and there could be other specific rights, tag along, drag along, put option, call option, all of those things that can be uh, included in these agreements. Some, uh, uh, a, you know, first time investor may not be familiar with all this, so the founders may be okay, or the investors may not use too many lawyers as well and may just take a draft of the, uh, of the internet and use it. Uh, but that's risky. Uh, at the same time, sophisticated investors, in particular international investors, will know all of these things. And will put in, not just in the agreement, they'll put in upfront in the term sheet as well. So, uh, so you need to understand how each of these things operate. What, what does it mean? Uh, you know, what are lockbox accounts? How valuations are going to be done? Who's going to do the valuation? If nobody can, uh, can do a valuation, do you go out and appoint uh, you know, investment banks to do valuations? And what methodology would be used for uh, evaluation? Uh, you know, you'll hear people talk about uh, DCF method, discounted cash flow, and all sorts of things. What What are these things? I mean, yeah. the thing is, you know, as lawyers, especially working in the commercial space or with finance, you can't shy away from it and say, you know, sorry, maths is not my thing, or economics is not my thing, and somebody will tell us what it is. But you are drafting the document. You have to put it in, in, the, in your draft. So... Uh, so I think all of this needs to be considered. What governing law clause you agree is important. You know, people randomly just sign on things saying, you know, the laws of Singapore and the arbitration in Singapore will apply. And then if it's a dispute, then you're thinking, how do we go to, or how do we arrange counsel in Singapore? You know, you could be choosing Dubai, which is much uh, closer, right? Uh, or English law, which is much more familiar. We are much more familiar with it as, as more common law lawyers in Pakistan. So uh, various aspects to consider, uh, and, and in terms of how you can get more involved, I mean, in how young uh, uh, lawyers interested in the space can get involved is by attending events, seminars, discussions, doing online courses in the space, uh, learning more about it, uh, going to incubators and accelerators, uh, you know, hanging out with people. There is there is no substitute to any of this, really. So even at this stage, uh, you know, if a NIC National Incubation Center in Karachi or Peshawar or Lahore will ask me to come and speak to their uh, startup group, I would want to take out time and interact with them. Yes, I'm sharing something with them, but invariably, you know, the 
the startups are also sharing something which we find interesting. For lawyers that have this expertise of working in technology transactions, I mean, you've given a few examples, but just to go into a bit more detail, what sort of work do they do, lawyers that specialize in technology transactions? So it could be anything from helping draft a term sheet or reviewing. Initially, it's, it'll start with somebody sent an NDA or an MOU to review. You can review that or draft one. Then it comes to term sheets. Then it'll go to actual documentation. Just before this podcast started, uh, a, you know, a Saudi client of mine sent a bunch of documents where they invested in a series A round of a tech company, uh, and they just want us to uh, to review. Uh, you know, if, if everything is in, in in order, right? So it could be just that. But there are like six documents you have to review and cross cross check if it, if they're all linked with each other. They make sense. Uh, they may need help with drafting their own board resolutions for approving the, re- the transaction internally, right? And uh, building its rationale and justification. Um, it, it could be uh, due diligence on the startup and its founders. They may ask us to do that. They may, uh, we've had uh, uh, investors ask us to help restructure startup companies in which they are investing. So if their structures are not proper, or if their shareholding uh, structure is not perfect, then you need to help them with that. Um, we've also been asked to review key uh, uh, counterparty agreements. So if a startup is relying heavily on uh, providing services to a few global corporations, you would want to review those agreements to see what are the termination provisions, you know, what are the change of control provisions, and, and so on. So, uh, so, 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 so it could be anything. So what starts normally if it's, if it's a new investment from NDAs, MOUs, term sheets, and then going into actual set of documents, uh, and depending on which stage of a startup this is, if it's a angel, pre-seed, seed, series A, or uh, you know, more developed uh, uh, company investment, uh, and, and then even helping with some of the things related to those startups, because investors bring in that value where at times because of their own investment they want startups to be guided properly. Um, you also help them at times with their uh, pitch documents. You know, so if you are a more commercial lawyer, like you know, I hope I am, uh, you, know, you work with startups to see if, if they are putting the right thing. Sometimes they are making outlandish claims. So from their point of view or how they're used to preparing pitches, you know, they may think it's all fine. But when you look at the document from a lawyer's perspective, you will say, oh, wait a minute, you can't really say this. Or you can't say it like this, right? Because you cannot uh, really, if somebody challenges that, uh, you know, confirm this. So, so again, this is for founders as well to realize that you know things need to be reviewed by lawyers. It even con- communication to investors, communication to others. Sometimes, uh, you know, you're making statements which can land you in a lot of trouble. So it's good to work with lawyers uh, for that. Uh, and on those things, uh, depending on licensing approval, you could be get involved in that. You're, uh, you know, if you're a fintech, you might need SECP, state bank approvals. Uh, they have a lot of questions and things, so they keep asking for information. You have to guide your client what information would the regular be expecting and how to provide it in as complete and accurate a manner as possible so it makes the regulator's life easy. Right, and the application process quicker. So in many cases, we feel the delays are because you know it's just back and forth because nobody is providing you know the right information in the right manner at the right time. So lawyers help with all of this, all the way to hopefully an initial public offering or an exit. Right. So if an IPO process kicks off, you help to help with the IPO readiness of the of the startup. Uh, you know, do all sorts of internal. A review uh, of uh, of documents of processes. They do agreements with underwriters, with the uh, with with the banks, with investment managers, uh, with collecting banks, and uh, you know comply with stock exchange requirements. Work on the prospectus with the financial uh, advisors. Um, you know and help with the listing process, and then issuance of shares. You know as a result of that issue, that listing process. So. Uh, so, so, the, so, so lawyers are required 
and will be part of the entire journey. But also, I mean, apart from legal skills and, you know, helping with the documentation and everything, what other skills or traits or qualities do you think founders look for when they're engaging a lawyer? I mean, I've always felt that um, they almost want the lawyer, even if it's an external lawyer, to be really part of the team and almost expect the same level of enthusiasm, which, I mean, I, I'm that type of a lawyer. I'm very detached. It's like I'm only excited about the legal work and I don't find myself caring too much about whatever the business is. But for startups, I've noticed lawyers, they celebrate almost like every milestone and they're just so excited. I mean, I think it's a... Uh, <clears throat> It has to come from within you, right? So you have to enjoy working with startups and startups will can feel that, right? So if, if somebody is interested and obviously you will add more value because the startups are also looking at you as your risk metrics, as their own risk metric, right? So they want you to identify risk for them in their journey. Say, no, 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 wait a minute. You can't do it like this. You should need to do it like that. Or, uh, you know, why are you doing this? That you can only do if you're a bit more involved uh, you know, at least at the uh, at the strategic level, you of course can't know everything that's going on in a startup organization. Uh, but some of that will be required unless the startup has grown big enough to employ in-house lawyers who can do that full time and employ uh, you know a risk officer, a compliance officer, and so on, which many of the startups end up doing that. Right, so uh, they. You, you know, and eventually startups, uh, when they are large enough, again, using the example of the, of the multi-billion dollar ones, you know, they will hire the best lawyers in the world to come and work for them in-house and will offer them equity or, and other incentives in return as well because they really want them to be a key part of their team because they know most of the things are hurdles in their way are legal hurdles. And risks are, again, also mostly legal risks. So anybody can can help with that journey uh, is is a critical member of their team. So hence the enthusiasm or not, right? Because if somebody is doing something, you'll be like, no, that's not how it goes. So yeah. uh, so 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 it's, I think it's it's a bit of bit of that. Uh, I would say I'm actually a bit more detached in companies where I have some some investments. Right? I let them get on with it unless they ask me. Because I'm not their lawyer. That's not my role, right? So I'll potentially have yeah. a conflict of interest in advising them on legal issues. So uh, I can guide them generally, but they have to have their lawyers. Uh, and uh, But where I am a lawyer, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fiduciary responsibility as well, I guess, to be more conscious and aware of what the client does and guide them properly. Uh, of course, to the extent that you know what the client is doing. So you don't always know what the client is doing. Yeah, um, yeah. So interesting space, a lot of opportunity. I think it's just uh, the beginning. There may be some ups and downs, like any journey in the coming months and years. But overall, I think this is only going up in the coming years. And uh, there's a need for a lot more uh, lawyers who can you know, sort of uh, cover this space because there are literally dozens, if not hundreds of uh, startups out there now in Pakistan. Yeah, and I think something you mentioned earlier about the cost aspect, I think that's a major reason why young lawyers can really tap into this space and, and get clients uh, that are looking for lawyers. Uh, I mean, you sometimes don't need somebody with 20 years of experience to give you legal advice or, or draft contracts. Just on a parting note, uh, any other advice that you can give to lawyers? Like, how can they really get into the space if they don't know anything about tech startups, whether it's networking or programs that they can join to get into this? I, I think they should visit the NICs in whichever city they are. They should visit other accelerators and incubators in the country. They should, there's a lot of virtual conferences being held now. So, uh, Park Launch is a venture I support. They have done a I think it's available online as well and uh, an investor conference uh, recently. So people should listen into these things. There are lots of uh, online sessions that others also host uh, that should be of interest. Um, and uh, 
then i mean they should also read up on what a startup is like so one of the thing one of my favorite books in the startup space is uh, the lean startup right so basically talks about how you need to keep yourself keep your business and your expenses lean and try to test out you know your uh, your project or your product and then decide very quickly if you if this is the right one or or uh, pivot to something else or you know fail fast kind of approach uh, so i mean you need to learn about read these books as well not just the law books but you know other books as well to understand what the founders are thinking like right so because they are reading these books so and they are trying to uh, you know work based on those uh, global sort of best practices and guidelines and uh, then uh, you know why combinator is a is a us based uh, accelerator program you know very well uh they have a uh, list of uh, you know documents th- th- their templates available on their website of you know the different things that i was mentioning the safe agreements and and so on so you should go and download those documents and read them i mean and, and actually read them properly to understand uh, y- you know what those documents are so you're better prepared if somebody comes to you and asks you that okay yeah i want to invest you shouldn't just say to them yeah you should take 5% equity in the startup and invest this much money you should be able to provide a creative solution uh, that yeah don't take that risk straight away maybe do a safe note this is how it works this is these will be the terms and so on uh, and, and i think be more aware about intellectual property requirements as well because that's a key area for startups especially technology startups so how does that work in pakistan and abroad if they need to do international registrations who do you contact you know in the US in UAE spare the key markets um but generally i think there's so much available on the internet now that uh, really it's uh, if somebody says sorry i don't have any access to information i mean i think that's a non starter then right so they should, they should just look out for for information and obviously i mean uh, subject to availability although i try to be as responsive as possible they can reach out to people like me on linkedin um they, you know and others there are other pakistan based lawyers as well who are doing excellent work in the space uh and are very busy doing so uh so reach out i think most uh, people would be happy to have a conversation with a fellow lawyer and to guide them as to how to uh you know advise their client linkedin is the best way to get in touch with you temur how else uh where else can they I, I, I get a hold of you uh, linkedin is the is, is the best uh, of course my details are available on my firm's website as well if they if they google my name uh, and uh, the other accounts are obviously i i treat them as more personal spaces twitter and other social media because uh, i mean you do all sorts of other discussions there but but yeah. LinkedIn, and this is this is something i would say to the young lawyers out there right create those distinctions uh create those spaces linkedin people are following you for your professional uh you know expertise they're not interested in your political views necessarily yeah. or or you know. so so that's for twitter and what not yes of course use these platforms to encourage people you're working with you know encourage startups uh, you know that you're working with or supporting of course that's key they need that visibility so if you have a following use that to everyone's advantage uh, no harm in that so uh So yeah so i would say uh, linkedin is the is the best place to start and then we can go from there well thanks so much temur for your time and sharing your thoughts i mean i learned a lot myself about the practice area so this was great and thank you to everyone else for tuning in if you have any comments for me my contact is in the description thanks again temur thank you very much I hope you guys enjoyed listening to Temur Malik talk about technology startup law. I think he gave some great suggestions and advice as well for lawyers to get into this space. For example, visiting the National Incubation Center in in Pakistan. Um I, I've just put that link in the description so check that out. I think you can become a mentor as a lawyer um with NIC. Um so that's a great way to connect with founders in Pakistan. One suggestion that I can give is to uh become a mentor with the Techstar accelerator program. Um check that out as well. Uh they have hybrid versions and virtual 
uh, accelerator programs around the world. So uh, again, great opportunity as a mentor to connect with uh, tech companies. Please also subscribe to the podcast, uh, rate it, review it. And don't forget to share with uh, fellow lawyers and law students in your network.